Welcome, Welcome to, to Freedom, Freedom Church. Church. You're about to watch our podcast. If you're new, go ahead and text CONNECT to that number on the screen. We want to meet you and put a gift in your hands. Free gift? All right, sign yeah. me up. Pretty cool. Hey, if you want to help keep this broadcast free for others, you can do that by visiting freedom.church slash give or by texting the word Freedom Church, that's one word, to 77977. What's up, Freedom Church? Hey, can we give it up for our youth worship team who absolutely killed it? Come on, let's make some noise for our worship students. You guys absolutely killed it. We are so grateful for you. Thank you for leading us in that time of worship. Aren't they just fantastic? For those of you who don't know me, my name's MJ. I'm the youth director here at Freedom Church, which means I get to hang out with everybody their age every week. So I think I have the best job here. Um, Pastor Justice started a brand new series for our church last week called Prodigal Church. And we talked about how we believe God is bringing us into this returning season for our church. And while I believe that there's tons of levels to this returning there's one area in particular that God put on my heart this week that I feel he's calling Freedom Church to return to as we enter into this season. And I believe that God is calling Freedom Church to return to the identity that he created the original church to bear. The church has been around for 2,000 years, and it's made it 2,000 years, not by accident. It had an identity that it held. It makes me think of James chapter 1 in verse 2 through 4. It says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Now, why would God call us to consider it joy when things get hard? Why would God call us to be consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when something shows up that you weren't expecting, why would we be called to consider it pure joy when we face trials? And that's because the author continues. He says, consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work in you so that you may be mature and complete lacking in nothing. Freedom Church, I believe that God is calling us to return to the identity of a church of perseverance. That we would be a church in a culture that is so easy to fall back that we would be the ones who stand up and push forward. You see, the word perseverance in the scriptures is the, is the Greek word hupomone. It sounds really funny. But hupomone literally means to endure through trials and troubles with a position of steadfastness. What this means is that when trials and troubles come up in our lives, when things get hard, when we get punched and we fall, that we would get back up. This steadfastness means that when we hit the ground, we'd stand back up, that we would continue to push through, we would continue to stand up, we'd continue to push forward when trials and troubles peak their head in our lives, that we would be a church marked by perseverance in a dark world. Right now in my life, I'm going through something that is causing perseverance. You see, I'm 22 years old, and in about four, I think it's about four and a half months now, is going to be my wedding day. Thank you, thank you. Four and a half months, I'm getting married to my best friend. We've been together for about six years. We're high school sweethearts. Um, yeah, she's, she's super adorable. Um, but you see, I'm getting married in four months, so right now I'm trying to get in the best shape of my life. My nutrition is on point. I'm hitting the gym every single day, not Sundays, but every single day, because I'm like, man, there is there's something coming. I gotta persevere through it. I gotta get in the best shape of my life because perseverance is gonna do a good work in me and I'm gonna make it to the finish line and be like, I made it, here is my best self, let's go have fun on the beach. <laughs> but you see, with this perseverance, a, a couple times in the past few months, I'm on this track, I'm pushing through, no trials getting in my way. And I walk home and open the door to my house and my mom's made about like 75 of the most beautiful soft, warm peanut butter cookies in the world. And I'm like, get behind me, Satan. There is no trial or temptation that's gonna pull me down. I'm gonna walk through this, looking at 
through saying, Satan, no way. I know where I want to go. I know where I need to get to. So I'm going to push through this trial. I'm going to put on hoopamone. You can't stop me with a cookie. And I'm going to make it all the way through. Because, again, perseverance is going to do a good work in me. And that cookie is going to get in the way of that good work. And while that's kind of funny, I don't think that that's the perseverance that God's calling our church to be marked by. Let's call that cookie perseverance. It's a worldly perseverance that says, I'm going to do this by my power for my name. I'm going to push through this because of me. I'm going to make it through this so that I look good. I'm going to make it through this so that my name's remembered. I'm going to equip myself with my own power, and I'm going to do a worldly perseverance that doesn't have anything to do with who Jesus is. That's not the perseverance that God is calling our church to be identified with. Pastor Justice taught us this word prodigal last week, and I want to put it on the screens and read the definition again so that we can understand who Jesus has called us to be identified as. The definition for prodigal is to be lavishly abundant, profuse, and recklessly extravagant. Imagine if Freedom Church returned to the identity of prodigal perseverance, and we had a prodigal perseverance, not a cookie perseverance. A perseverance that said, I can push through anything that comes my way, not because of anything special about me, but because of he who lives in me. I, I, no matter what comes my way, I'm going to push through. My perseverance is going to be so lavishly abundant that the world will have no choice but to look at me and say, I saw what happened in your life. There's no way that you should be walking with the joy that you have right now. What is it about you that allows you to push through this trial in your life? Sometimes we get a diagnosis and it should crush us, yet we walk through it with perseverance that is unexplainable. And the world says, there's no way that you should be standing up right now. The world should have knocked you down. You should be down and out. How are you up and how are you joyful in telling a story? That our identity would be prodigal perseverance, a perseverance that makes no sense in this world. That we would be equipped with so much perseverance, such a magnitude of reckless, extravagant perseverance, that the world would say, what is it about you? And the answer would be that it has nothing to do with me. To show us what this looks like, I want to read a story from the end of Jesus' life. Jesus shows us three things. If, if we're trying to be like anybody, it's Jesus. And so Jesus says, if I've called you to pers prodigal perseverance, I've called you to equip yourself in this area, and I'm going to show you how, because we have to return to three areas if we want to see this perseverance in our lives, in our church, and in our identity. And so in Mark chapter 14, Jesus is, as I said, this is towards the end of Jesus' life. He's getting ready to be betrayed by his best friends. He's getting ready to be beaten for something he didn't do. He's getting ready to be hung on a cross and dehumanized in a way that is arguably one of the most dehumanizing things the world has ever seen. And Jesus knows what's coming. He knows what's next for him. Yet in this passage, he throws, shows us, hey, how do we return to a prodigal perseverance that doesn't make sense and can tell a story that we're still talking about today. So in Mark 14, it says, Then Jesus went to this olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go and pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground, and he prayed, If it is possible, let this awful hour awaiting me pass by. Abba, Father, Jesus cried out, Everything is possible for you, so please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want it to be your will that's done, not my own. And then he returned and found the disciples asleep, and he said to them, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In Jesus' most difficult, hard moment of his perfect life, he shows us three things that we have to return to if we want to carry this identity of prodigal perseverance rather than cookie perseverance. The first thing that Jesus shows us is he says, if you want to be 
identified by prodigal perseverance, it's time to return to community. The first thing Jesus does in the midst of the hardship is he says, Peter, James, John, come with me. The hardest moment of my life, Jesus could have said, I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to isolate myself and do something that only I can do. I have the power. I have the name. I have everything I need to do to get through this on my own. Yet what Jesus does in the midst of trial is he says, I need, I need my, my boys around me. I need community around me. Because what Jesus shows us in this story that we need to learn if we want to be identified as prodigal perseverant church is that we were created to be stronger in community. We were created to be able to go through more when we have a community of people supporting us who say, let me remind you what your identity is. Let me remind you what the truth is. Let me remind you who your God is. And most importantly, let me remind you whose you are. Because when we step away from community, when we isolate ourselves, we actually put ourselves right in the middle of Satan's playing field. When we say, I'm too good for community, I can handle this problem on my own, I'm strong enough. They don't know my story, they don't know what I've gone through, I can handle this without them. When we say, I can handle this on my own, we step into Satan's playing field where all of a sudden, the truth that we know becomes a lot harder to hear and the lies start overwhelming us and all of a sudden we don't remember who we are. All of a sudden, the truth of the power of God in our lives starts to fade away and we just feel like we're alone and we can't push through. And the, the amazing thing about this is that we've seen this take place in our own lives in the past year. We've been in a season of isolation, not by our own choice, but we've been for students, you weren't going to school, right? You're home alone, you're home alone, you're home alone. They were not in their community. They did not have their peers and in, in their mentors around them to, to speak life into them, to invest in them, to help them grow. Community is one of the most essential things to a middle schooler and high schooler's life, yet it was stripped away. So does it surprise us that we begin to believe the lies of the enemy in that in the peak of isolation in 2020, the suicide attempt rate and success rate of students their age went up 250%. They had become isolated, not by their own choice, but they had been placed on Satan's playing field where he said, I'm going to take advantage of this. I'm going to convince you you have no worth. I'm going to convince you you bring no value to this world. I'm going to convince you that this is a better place without you. Because when we don't have a community around us, how are we supposed to remember the value that we bring? How are we supposed to remember the strength that we have? I promise you, if Jesus needed to be surrounded by his closest community in the midst of his hardship, I sure do. Jesus was perfect. And he needed community in trial. If we want to be identified by prodigal perseverance, we have to surround ourselves with community. We don't say life is better in groups at Freedom Church because we want to add two more numbers to our programming system to say, hey, look, we have 800 people in life groups. We're doing a fantastic job. We say life is better in groups because we understand that God created us. The creator created the creation with an innate need for community. We're trying to equip you so that you can go into the dark world and be identified by prodigal perseverance because once a week, you're meeting with people who love you. You're meeting with people who are bringing truth into your darkness. You're meeting with people who say, hey, do you remember what God did in your life just a month ago? And yet you're already straying away? Life is better in groups. We are created for community. So when we isolate ourselves, we're saying, I can handle this on my own. When in reality, we were never created to walk this life by ourselves. We have to return to community if we want to be identified with prodigal perseverance. Because we can't push through this world on our own. The second thing that Jesus shows us in this story about what we need to return to is he says, return to community. Get a group of people around you who, who love you and who invest in you and who support you. And then he says... Return to vulnerability. And I know I'm not the only one in this room who does not like that word. <laughs> but it makes sense. The world has, has taught us and conditioned us to believe that we have to 
cover ourselves. We have to hide. We have to pretend as if nothing's wrong because vulnerability to the world literally means to expose your heart to pain, to expose yourself to threat, to expose yourself to terror, literally opening your heart for an opportunity to get hit. So when we say, Jesus says, if I want to be marked by prodigal perseverance, I have to return to vulnerability. We say, how would it make sense that if I want to push through my trials, I have to place myself in the position of weakness? It, it shouldn't make sense. Jesus comes to his friends and says, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He says, I'm not okay in this moment. The circumstances surrounding me are putting a weight upon me, and I'm not okay. He even says, the spirit is willing, but my flesh is weak. I'm not okay in this moment. And if Jesus is willing to reveal his heart and say, I'm not okay, can I encourage you that it's okay to not be okay sometimes? You've gone through things in your life. You've done things that have caused you to not be okay. And you can't pretend that you are. You can't keep covering yourself up with armor saying, I'm okay, I'm okay. That really, that didn't happen. That didn't, that didn't do something in my heart. That didn't cause a wound in my soul. And sometimes it's not even things we did. Sometimes it's things that have been done to us by no fault to our own. And we're not okay. Yet we refuse to say, I'm not okay. What Jesus shows us here is that he's recreating what vulnerability is supposed to be. While the world says you can't expose your heart because it's an opportunity to be hurt, Jesus says, no, 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 no. I'm asking you to open your heart in vulnerability, not so that you get hurt, but so that I have an opportunity to heal it. When we put our guard down and say, hey, this is what's happening. I'm not okay, and I'm recognizing it. We now have invited Jesus into the atmosphere so he can say, let me do what you can't. Let me touch you in a way that you can't touch your own heart. Here's the deal. We created sin, and sin has done things to us that we were never created to fix on our own. So why are we going to continue to walk through this life with, when there's trials and things happening and we say, I'm okay. When Jesus is saying, no, 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 it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. When you identify, I'm not okay, we're inviting Jesus to make us okay. Because what it looks like to have prodigal perseverance is to say, Jesus, I need you to do something to me so that you can do something through me. But when we never identify what's happening in our lives and we don't come to vulnerability, we're pushing Jesus out of the picture because we're saying, I can handle this. I don't need you. Yet when Jesus shows up, everything changes. It makes me think, I was an athlete growing up and I was constantly getting scratches and cuts and wounds all over my body. And the first thing I would do, I would come home and put a big Band-Aid on it because I needed it to be covered. I couldn't let things to get in it. The same thing happens with our, our hearts. We get hurt and we, we cover up. And it's okay to cover up for a period because we have to deal with what's happened to us and through us. But if you understand, if you never take the Band-Aid off, the wound is never going to heal. If you keep a Band-Aid covering a cut for your entire life, it's going to stay a cut forever. It's never going to, it needs to be exposed. Our hearts need to be exposed. We need to take the Band-Aid off and let Jesus do something to us that we can't do to ourselves. Because when we return to vulnerability, we're exposing our wounds, not so that we can get made fun of, not so that we can be traumatized and hurt, but so that Jesus can touch us and heal us in a way that only he can do. We have to return to vulnerability. If Jesus can say, I'm not okay, let me, let me tell you what's, what's happening. This is why we need community, because we need somebody to be vulnerable with. You can't be vulnerable with yourself. The third thing that Jesus shows us that we have to return to in order to be marked and identified with prodigal perseverance. He says, return to community, because they make you stronger. Return to vulnerability, because it's an opportunity for healing. And lastly, Jesus shows us in this story, he says, it's time to return to prayer. We've gotta stop trying to tackle our trials and our troubles on our own strength. We've gotta stop saying, I don't need my community. I don't need to be vulnerable. I'm strong. I can get through this on my own. 
when Jesus, who was God himself, come on, God himself in the midst of his trials took three opportunities to not isolate himself, but to go to a time of solitude. Isolation is pulling away saying, I've got this. Solitude is a time where we plug in to say, God, you've got this. I can't do this on my own. I don't have the strength to push through what's happened to me. I don't have the strength to push through this temptation that is constantly peeking its head to me. I don't have the strength. If I isolate myself, I'm pulling away and giving in to the weakness. Yet when I take time to be with Jesus, when I take time to be with God, I'm saying, God, I need you to show up. I need you to equip me. I need you to strengthen me. I need you to come do something that nobody else can do. Why would we not take the opportunity to invite the God of the universe who resurrected from the dead to show up in the midst of our trials? Why would we say, I've got this, when God said, I already took care of it? He wants to show up in the midst of our mess to do something that only he can do. Because when Jesus shows up into the picture, he changes everything. And he wants somebody in here today to hear, you don't have to fight alone. You don't have to keep pushing through what life has dealt you by yourself. You weren't created to do it, so stop trying to bear it. Let me show up and do what I died to do. And to kind of show you what this really looks like, I want to ask my friend Jimena to come share her story. Because there's a time when God showed up and he did what only he can do. Hi, everybody. My name is Jimena. I'm a part of Freedom Youth here at Freedom Church, and this is my story. When I was 10 years old, I developed severe anxiety. This meant when I woke up every day, I had this overwhelming fear that would take over me and control me throughout the days. I, this affected me very much physically and emotionally. So I, sometimes I couldn't even get ready to school because there was this fear trying to pull me away, pull me away from my community. And once my parents noticed this, they noticed that this wasn't just a one-time thing, that this wasn't just a one-time little episode, they turned to God because that's what they knew. And we started doing prayers and we started doing devotionals. And these two very important Bible, Bible verses that my mom has taught me that, that were my prayer, the first one was, God has not given me a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and self-control. And that's 2 Timothy 1.7. And the second one is, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. And that's Psalms 34.4. And as, and as time went on, when I had one of these episodes, I used those verses as my prayer, and they were just the same. So it's, I, I got better and better. And as time went on, I got better and better, and here I am. I'm healed. <laughs> and I want to encourage anybody that if they ever felt, if they have felt like me or, ha, or have been feeling these feelings that I have felt, that if God can heal me, he can heal you too. So never give up on God, have perseverance. Thank you. Hello, my name is Nathan. I'm also a youth student here at the church. Um, and I'm just gonna be sharing a story with you guys. When I, when I was growing up, I never really surrounded myself with the best community. Uh, the people that I called my friends most of my life never cared never really liked me, never really accepted me, never really loved me and accepted me as their friend. Most of the time they kept me around for a quick laugh and and that was really it. I started to go home every day and look in the mirror and say, oh, that's why I'm not good enough. Uh, I don't wear clothes correctly or, right, these shoes don't fit me right or I don't like how this looks or or that looks. This became a routine in my day-to-day life every single day. I would come home, go to school, come home, look in the mirror and say, I'm not good enough for the world. I had a really big family growing up that loved me and cared for me, and that was really my only community that loved me. But even when I was going through one of the deepest moments in my life where nobody knew, I still couldn't be vulnerable because I felt embarrassed, or I felt like I wasn't good enough for, for it. God was always a big part of my life. He's always done miracles in my life. He, he's always helped my family in tremendous ways. But believing these lies that I wasn't good enough for friends or the world made me stray away from him farther than I ever could imagine. 
I kept digging myself a hole by believing these lies that the world told me that I wasn't good enough. One day I came back from school and I was just tired. I was, I was depressed, I was sad, I didn't know what to think anymore. I went in my room, I got on my knees and I said, God, you're the only person that can help me through this. I know you're there, I know you're real and I, I really just, I really need your help. I wanna feel loved again, I wanna feel accepted. I was on my knees there just praying to him and, and in that moment I finally felt loved by someone. I finally felt accepted. From that moment, I, I, I started begging my mom to go to youth group. I started begging my mom to go to church. I started begging my family to take me to these places. And before I knew it, I was getting surrounded by a godly community that finally loved me and accepted me with my leaders, my pastors, all surrounding me. And finally, for the first time in my life, I felt loved in the community and I was able to share. I was able to be open. I was able to be vulnerable for the first time in my life and tell my stories and tell what I was going through to these people and my friends. I began to realize that me telling these stories to my friends and, and these students around me, they were going through the same things as me, depression, anxiety, and feeling like they weren't good enough for everybody. I began to finally see and open up to God and, and everybody else and really just understand why God put me here and understand that God gives me confidence and I developed that godly confidence that no matter how anybody looks at me, God loves me. And that's how I'm gonna go out the door in the morning. We started to pray. We started to understand, we started to understand that being vulnerable opened us up to this community. And in this community, we were vulnerable and helped others and, and healed others. We began to pray and understand this. We began to pray for ourselves and others. We began to finally feel loved. If I just wanted to encourage you, if God can help me in one of the worst moments in my life at such a young age, whatever you're going through, no matter how old or how young, as long as you open up and you're vulnerable to God, he will give you that community and he will answer you. I know he will. Thank you. I want to finish with this. A couple days ago, I was listening to a pastor and I heard him talking about King David in the Bible. And he was talking about over and over and over again in the course of David's life, it was always mentioning that God was with David. God was with David in his victory. God was with David in his defeat. He was with David in his failure. He was with David in his success. Over and over and over again, God was with David. And it got me thinking, what was it about David that made it so that God was always near him? Because I know I'm not the only one and I know there's people in this room who are going through trials right now. You're on the ground and you feel like not getting up because you're like, God, I'm hearing all these stories, but I feel like you're not near to me. I can't see you in the face of these trials anymore. I don't know where you are and I feel isolated and alone and I don't even know where to look. Yet what this pastor said was that there's nothing special about David that made God near to him. It was that David was constantly in a position, in a pursuit of God. In the midst of success, in the midst of failure, in the midst of victory, and in the midst of defeat, David said, I'm gonna pursue my God. I'm gonna be in prayer. I'm gonna pursue his heart. I'm gonna pursue his grace. I'm gonna pursue his name because if I know anything about my God, it's that when I seek him, I will find him. When I call him out, he will show up. When I'm overwhelmed with what's happening in my life and I know I can't do it, if I push into who he is, I will not be alone. This year was one of the hardest years of my life. It started with a phone call from my parents that my dad had been diagnosed with kidney cancer. And as a 21 year old kid at the point, I didn't know how to fathom the fact that my best friend, my hero, my leader was now having cancer. I, I saw my dad overwhelmed with the news of what was happening inside of his body. And at the same time, our world's hit with a pandemic. And my mom's a supervisor at a hospital where she's trying to care for the needs of my father, yet she's being called in overtime to a hospital where she has to pour everything inside of her out to the needy. 
And so then here I am coming home every day, seeing the effects of the trials that have been placed in front of my family. And, and I don't know where to, I don't know how to push. I can see the fatigue in my dad's eyes. I hear my mom crying every night because she's trying to hold everything together. And to make it all worse, a few months later, I get sat down at the kitchen table. And my parents tell me that my dad had been diagnosed with another cancer. Two cancer diagnoses is in less than a 12 month span. And it felt as if I, I had just been knocked to the floor and I wanted to throw the flag. And if I wanted to throw the flag, I can't imagine what my dad and my mom were actually going through in the moment when my dad doesn't know what his future looks like. My mom's fearful for her husband's life, yet also trying to care for the lives of hundreds of people in a hospital. And when everything feels like it's crashing down and I'm ready to give up, and I think my parents are ready to give up, I'm walking back to my room one night and I see my parents' doorway cracked. And when they could have been crying and they could have been figuring out what things are gonna look like, I saw the knees of the two people who should have thrown in the towel on the ground crying out to a God who can show up. That in the face of the biggest trial of their life and in my life, when they could have run, they said, God, we, we can't do this, but we know you can do this. We know that if we provide the space, you can show up. Because when you show up, everything changes. And can I tell you that not only did that give me the perseverance to keep pushing, not only did that do something inside of me, but can I tell you that not even a year later, my dad's been healed of two cancers? Can I tell you that not even a year later, you would never know that this guy had two cancers inside of his body and he was fighting for his life. Yet I told you at the beginning that God wants to mark us with prodigal perseverance, not so that he can simply do something to us, but that so he can do something through us. What if I told you that a week ago, the same guy who was laying in bed every day with two cancers, who's been healed, led a men's event, told a story of what God did in his life and over 200 men gave their life to Jesus. What if I told you that God wants to identify his church with prodigal perseverance, not so that we look good, not so that we can have some cookie story to tell, but because he wants to take the impossible things in your life and fix them. He wants to take the things that you are so close to giving up on and work through them. That he sees the things where you're fighting on your own and you're ready to throw in the white towel and say, I can't push through it anymore. That when he shows up, you'd be marked by a prodigal perseverance that is so recklessly extravagant that there'd be no excuse other than that the God of miracles showed up and showed out. I want to encourage you today that when we invite God into our trials, when we say, God, I can't, he says, I know, but I can. We get to serve the God who turns anxiety into an opportunity to tell a story. We get to serve the God who takes insecurity and turns it into an opportunity to show the goodness of a powerful God who overcomes insecurity. And we get to serve a God, as we sang this morning, who makes cancer disappear. And so I don't know the trial that you're going through in your life. I don't know why you're ready to give up. I don't know what's in front of you or what's been done to you. But can I encourage you this morning that there's a God who wants to show up? Can I encourage you that there's a God who wants to show up and do something to you so that he can do something through you? That the reason the church has been around for 2,000 years is because we, it was a group of people who said, God, I'm going to push through so that you can do something. And there's going to be a story to tell a dark world about a God full of light who shows up and changes everything. We have to return to prayer because we weren't created to push through these things on our own. And God wants the opportunity to make a miracle happen because we serve a God of miracles. He's not holding them back. He's just waiting for us to ask. If you would, can we have everybody stand to their feet?
if Jesus needed to return to community, if Jesus needed to practice vulnerability, and if Jesus himself had to drop to his knees and ask God of heaven to show up, I promise you when we do that, something's gonna happen in this church, something's gonna happen in this city, something's gonna happen in this world when we return to the identity that we were created to hold because the God of miracles is saying, I'm ready to work. I just need you to return to who I created you to be. You're my hands and feet. And I want you to know that whatever you're fighting, whatever trial has peaked its head in your life, whoever in here is ready to give up and say, I've been punched, I've been knocked down, I'm, I've gotten the diagnosis, I'm, I'm out of energy and I have nowhere left to turn. It's time to throw in the towel. That today is the day you meet Jesus and he changes everything. That the big thing in your life that's keeping you up at night, that Jesus says, yeah, I got that too. That the trial you're pushing through, Jesus says, I got it too. And that the pain in your heart that seems as if it was never going to go away, that he says, I've got it too. Because when you identify yourself with me, you become a son and a daughter. And I want to heal you. I want to work through you. I want to love you. I want to give you a community. I want to let you practice vulnerability. And I want to show my power in your life. When Jesus shows up, everything changes. There's no trial too big for him. There's no trouble too big for him. There's no anxiety too big for him. There's no cancer too big for him. There's nothing too big for God in today's the day to say, I'm done fighting for myself. I'm done trying to tackle the things in my life that I was never created to push through. I'm done trying to solve things by myself. I'm done trying to isolate myself and put on a tough show. Today is the day I'm saying, Jesus, if you did it for them, you can do it for me. If you healed their cancer, you can heal mine. If you healed their anxiety, you can heal mine. If you've done it for them, he can do it for you. And so with every eye closed, I wanna give the opportunity today for somebody to stop fighting on their own. That today would be the day when you realize you don't have to push through on your own strength. That today would be the day when you say, Jesus, I'm yours. I want you to do something in me so you can do something through me. Because we get to serve a God who makes anxiety go away, makes insecurity go away and who makes cancer go away, not for a cookie perseverance, but a prodigal perseverance that makes no sense because we can push through what the world says we can't. And if that's you today and you're saying, I'm done fighting, I need a community, I need to say I'm not okay, but most importantly, I need Jesus to do something in me that only he can do. On the count of three, I just want you to put your hand in the air. No one's looking, we just wanna be there for you so that you can go on a new road you can experience a new life with a God who loves you. So on the count of three, if you wanna meet Jesus today and be marked by prodigal perseverance, just shoot your hand in the air. Three, two, one, today's the day. I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. We're with you, we're with you too, we're with you. If you're online and today's the day you're done fighting for yourself, type I believe in the chat because when Jesus shows up, everything changes and we don't have to fight for ourselves. We get community, vulnerability, and a God who says, I'm with you, I'm for you, I'm doing something in you so I can do something through you. So let's give God some praise and worship the God of miracles who says, I'm not done with you yet, I'm writing a story and you're a part of it. And let's give God some praise. So this is the moment that I just surrendered.